welcome. Thank you very much for coming. And the skies have parted, and I guess the good Lord was with us this morning. Make sure we can make this meeting. So. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it very much. Just again, our mission, as you know, is a privilege here. It includes responsibility and care for the natural world around us. And therefore, our Bentry Lake and Wildlife Works Preserve and Natural Beauty and Wildlife of Bentry by encouraging BTCI and all residents to be good stewards of our natural resources. And that's what we go by, and that's how we judge, and that's how we make a decision whether we want to do something. So. Recent activity. I can't fail but to put this up there for all you to see. Um, as you know, the Bentry Stream Keepers, uh, our group of people that monitor the water and all the chemicals and, and animals and macros and so on, won the Georgia Adopted Stream uh, Award for the State of Georgia for the Excellence in Data Collection. And uh, I want to put this up because I want to know that there's over a thousand volunteers that do this all over the state of Georgia. 57 people training us, 743 sites that are monitored. So uh, those sites generated 22,700 data points during 2022. It's a lot of input. Um, we probably put in about 1,200 to 1,800 of that our, ourselves. 5,000 monitoring events that took place, people actually going out into the water. And with all that in the workshops, um, we were considered number one in excellence in data collection. So I <laughs> It's a team award. It's a team award for excellence. And uh, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't just mention our team. So some of the team is here today. So I'm just going to ask as I call your name to stand up. And maybe you can applaud them after they're all standing because that's the team. That's what does this and puts this together. Obviously, Dara is part of that, myself. Mason Holland, Danny Day, Kim and Dave Stewart, James Smith. Laura and Dave, Brian George, Alicia Klink, Boo and Hugh, and last but not least, Megan. How about a round for our help? Thank you. Um, I just want to mention that it not only is a, a workshop, they call it a conference. Um, it was up in Helen. It was for a weekend. But we were very fortunate to attend. And also, Susan was with us, Susan Smith, and uh, Susan also joined and went. And for those of us that were there, we got to go to sessions, and they're really interesting for people here on data, exploring data, building resilience and green infrastructure. That was stormwater management and uh, how to grow different plants that, that manage the water. There was a session on beavers, the legislative updates on what they're going to do this year for water and water control, pending legislation, microplastics in our waters, which was very interesting, um, also snakes, and of course aquatic macro, that's Kim and Dave, but vertebrae. There was classroom and field hands-on classes that we also attended on stream bank restoration and also uh, Sue was lucky and had fun at Geology of Georgia Watershed, which was a hike of uh, two miles up into uh, falls and seeing all the geology in the watersheds. The stream bank restoration is what you see here, and uh, that's Kim's husband, Dave. Uh, we were the only team that had stream keeper t-shirts, and so it was interesting. But uh, this group was doing <coughs> complete restoration of the, of the banks of the stream. And we've done some of that here, and it was really interesting to see these people work together. Uh, the gentleman here in blue, his name is Jack White. Um, and, and, uh, okay. and Jack, um, Jack is an expert at this. He was the leader of this particular workshop, and uh, he's done this for many, many years. He's a hydrologist. He has various degrees um, from Georgia State. Georgia Tech and uh, showed us how to put down the matting, the rocks, and uh, all kinds of ways to do that and do it in a natural way. So um, I just wanted to mention that because it's important, it's something we're looking at. And we were able to talk to the different leaders of these, and some of them have volunteered to come and speak to us, which is good. And Jack White himself has, has talked to me and I've emailed him and he's willing to come up and give our streams and, 
and banks a look to see what we would probably do as best to take care of our banks, but also silt. So we hope to have him up here to take a look at Ben Tree, and he would be happy to come. He said, I'll be happy to come, witness warmer. But I think it was well worth the time. And if there's anybody else that wants to join, it's every year, the second year, uh, week in March. And uh, <laughs> it's $30. I mean, it's not a big expense to go. And uh, a lot of leaders. Okay, moving right along. Um, recently, and things to come, the Echo articles, as you know, there was an Echo article on Lake and Wildlife. Um, a couple of things were missed in it, but it was not a big deal. We're going to have another one on the AAS award that you just saw, as well as more uh, stuff on Lake and Wildlife. Fishery improvement, uh, obviously you know the fish are in and the habitats are in and uh, most importantly, uh, you know, we, we've got a really good activity going on out there, especially with the feeders. Um, Huff, any short addition to that? I know you said the fish are doing well, right? Uh, only that the, um, uh, we put in 50,000 bluegill a few weeks ago. Um, Surprisingly, I would have thought we'd have lost five or ten in the transport from Arkansas. Only two fish <coughs> floated to the top dead out of the 50,000. It was a remarkable wow. combination of the perfect temperature and the water in the truck and the lake, 58 degrees in both, and that helped a lot. Um, the fish have now moved throughout the lake because they're feeding pretty vigorously in almost all the feeders. Um, <coughs> People who have feeders, we have eight around the uh, lake now. Five that are privately owned have been adopted by Lakeshore residences, and three that are on the docks themselves. And um, the, not only have they attracted uh, the fish, but the wood ducks have figured it out. And uh, they're flying into feeders at the right time, waiting for the food to go off. It's not a bad thing. Not, not a bad thing at all. So, um, the habitat structures that are there are beginning to grow with little grass and moss. We noticed yesterday I was out fishing that uh, on my depth finder I could see fish around the habitat structures, which, so they're working well. And um, fishing um, yesterday, um, we, uh, a friend of mine who's an excellent fisherman and I, caught and released 41 bass in five hours. Wow. Now, all of them were like this, I have to say. One pretty good size, but a third of them were females full of eggs getting ready to spawn. So we're in what's called the pre-spawn era now, And but it looks to me like that the lake is beginning to come alive again with, with fish and feeding and food. And um, so uh, we have two more stockings uh, this year we have um, thriftin shad, which are coming in, I think, next week. That's to feed the bass to kind of keep their attention away from the smaller fish that are being hatched out and the bluegill. And then uh, we have crawfish that are going in in May. That's to feed the bass as well. We have probably too many bass in the lake because there's a certain size. I've taken about 20 or so out, put them in the, in the golf course ponds, put them in the Dr. Levine has a little pond next to the uh, uh, next to the marina there, and uh, but with the f continued food, the crawfish and the threadfin shad, I think that uh, you, we're going to see that our bass are going to grow, and then we have a the second stage is to stock northern bass next year, which are a very aggressive uh, genetic variety to improve the genetics of the bass in the lake and to start seeing some larger bass in there. So, um, so far, so good. I'm really pleased at the response the lake has made to, uh, to the steps we've taken, so. Thanks, Huff. Good report. Um, the McKay Benton Trail hike is taking place, and there's uh, work that's been done at Sally Dawes to clean that up, and there's a little more work left to do. As far as the trails, uh, hike, and uh, Sally Doss, um, Mason, any update? Anything you want to mention? No, I'd just like to thank everybody that came to the trail maintenance stand at Sally Doss. We moved a lot. It looked like a pretty daunting pile that could have taken weeks, but it was gone in two hours or something like that. <laughs> so it was pretty amazing. And then our hike on the Ben Mackay Trail, uh, that was fun. We had uh, 
fair turnout. We had 14 people on that, and we had been rain delayed for about a month, week after week. And so it was good to get it done, and uh, we'll look forward to the next one that we lead on that. Thank you, Mason. Major Explorers and the Kids Club, I know um, Darius been working on that very hard with their contacts, and, and that's coming along. Um, I don't know if there's anything more to add on the Kids Club. If there's something that uh, Mark, Mark, you'd like to talk, you know. It's going great. Okay. Go ahead. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Well, good morning. When uh, a few months ago, when we were trying to work up the uh, uh, partners programs, I volunteered to do the April presentation. And after I did that, I said to myself, "Oh crap! What am I going to talk about? <laughs> crap! <laughs> crap! That's what I'm going to talk about. Wildlife crap." And tracks. So anyway, here we are. But uh, before we get into the program, I want to um, give you a couple of updates on some things that are happening uh, that the uh, Wildlife Committee is working on. Feral hog sightings. At the last one that was reported to um, public safety was in early March. And there were some a sow and some piglets up on the, around Denny Ridge. And uh, I talked with Mike Corey yesterday, and he said no one's reported any since then. Now, I'm sure they're still around, but uh, if you see any, make sure you call uh, public safety before you put it on the next door. <laughs> so anyway, and I've, uh, I've talked to John Leach to make sure he's on the lookout uh, around the golf course. Uh, if he sees any evidence to let us know. Uh, Mike is uh, getting in touch with a couple of trappers just to have them on a speed dial in case we need them. Uh, now, we'd only need a trapper if we really have an infestation of hogs where we're seeing they're getting out of hand. So anyway, just keep an eye on it. Deer study. Uh, Last year, uh, UGA uh, embarked on a program called Community uh, uh, in, uh, Living in Communities that uh, Have Deer and the Issues that Are Associated with Communities that Have Deer. This uh, young man by the name of uh, Shane uh, Bohm, who's a, he's working on his master's and He's in charge of this program, and they were looking for communities to participate in the study. Uh, originally, they were looking for maybe five or six communities. I think we're down to two communities now. Uh, we here at Bentry agreed to participate. It's free, and hopefully we'll get some good uh, uh, information out of that. Uh, the other community is Martin's Landing somewhere near in Atlanta. But uh, anyway, uh, earlier this month, we had a, our first focus group meeting here at Bent Tree. We had about a dozen people that participated and uh, it was to kick off this program, this study. Uh, they wanted some input on how the community were handling the deer and what they felt about the deer, whether they like them, you don't like them, you don't care, whatever. Um, there's going to the the next step is a survey, a community-wide survey that Shane wants to conduct to get more input from the community on deer experience issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, not sure what format that survey is going to take, but in talking to Shane yesterday, it appears that they're going to do, they're going to put the survey in the mail, uh, and it'll probably be a four or five page survey, 
and it takes about 15 minutes to respond to it. And that information is going to be uh, uh, gathered by UGA and uh, DNR and that analyzed to formulate some recommendations uh, as a result of these uh, surveys. So sometimes in late May, early June, you'll probably be getting that uh, survey in the mail, in your, in your mailbox. Uh, don't throw it away. Take a few minutes, fill it out, be honest, and that's what they're looking for, is uh, some uh, honest to God uh, input from the residents on, uh, on the deer in our community. So, and we'll try to get a, uh, when we know the dates, we'll try to get something in Friday news or what have you to alert you that that survey is coming up. So, um, be aware that that's coming and um, the, uh, the recommendations are probably gonna be made later on in the fall and uh, hopefully we'll get something good out of it. Doesn't cost us anything to do it, so we'll take take advantage of it. Uh, beavers, uh, they're still active. There's still a lot of trees left out there, but uh, they uh, they're still active in the lake. Um, uh, the geese, uh, not sure we have any nesting on the on the lake right now. There were two hanging out around Goose Island. There was a gander and a goose, and uh, I've been watching them in the last two weeks. I haven't seen them. If you see them on the lake nesting, let public safety or me or somebody on our committee know uh, we need to go deactivate the eggs so we don't have any young geese um, all over our uh, beach area. Um, Otter, I had a, a call that uh, somebody thought they saw an otter on the lake. Not sure. Anybody seen a evidence of an otter on the lake? Robert, I think you may be the one that called me. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully not. Uh, um, yeah, if you see, um, if you see an otter, uh, make sure you bring it to somebody's attention because. Uh, they get into those 50,000 bluegills, they can, uh, they can snap up quite a few of them. So we need to keep an eye on those. Bears, still seeing bears. Uh, Luann, I think you ran across some bears. Yeah. Mine Recently. are three cubs coming down a little pine mountain. In the pitch dark, when I came up over the, the curve right at the entrance to Club Tamarack, there they both were, or all four of them were right in the middle of the road. And I had to slam my brakes on him. I mean, they just walked down the hill in the middle of the road. They didn't get off for a long time. So be really careful. I've had that exact same experience. Kid? Yeah. Dark. We, Jane and I had seven in our backyard about a week ago. <coughs> it was a sow with three cubs and a sow with two cubs. They didn't mix those so two groups, family units, but uh, yeah. Okay. The only other thing is, I uh, understand there was a skunk run over right on Tamarack and Indian Beach. We haven't seen a skunk in Big Tree in a while. Anyway, any other uh, wildlife activity that uh, is worthy of mention? Okay. Yeah. The eagles. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. That's that's good. Uh, hopefully, we'll see some ospreys also since we cleaned out the nest. Yeah. yeah and I, I think I saw a walk nest monster the other day, <laughs> <laughs> but it was right after the St. Patty's Day party. So <laughs> we we've got some scat samples. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Moving on, what I want to talk about this morning is, uh, and uh, before I get started, uh, 
If you're still eating your uh, donuts, I'll wait until you finish eating your donuts before we, before we move on. And uh, yeah, uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, identifying bent tree wildlife. And uh, you know, there are several ways to identify wildlife. One, the best way is if you see them. Um, that's a sure sign that you know it's wildlife, and you see them. Uh, sound. Uh, if you don't have any sound and you're just trying to identify wildlife, uh, tracks and scat are two other options, uh, ways to try to identify wildlife. And what I want to cover this morning is just uh, maybe help you if you see uh, scat or tracks and you're not sure what it is, how you might be able to identify what was on your porch or what was on your deck or what was in your flower garden or what may be in your attic. So anyway, we're going to talk some of the uh, animals uh, in, in uh, Bent Tree. Um, we probably have 20 somewhat species of uh, mammals in, in uh, Bent Tree. I'm not going to cover them all. Uh, but um, I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, s trying to identify by the size of the animal, where you might find them, uh, what the tracks look like and how to examine the tracks, and uh, being able to identify some wildlife just by the way they walk or they run and th what their gait is. So uh, we're going to uh, take a look at some of that. Identifying scat. Uh, again, the animals that are in bent tree. And uh, did you know that scat sort of falls into three categories? You can have a tubular, pellets, or plop. <laughs> so just keep that in mind when you're when you're searching for your scat. It falls in one of those three categories, and that may help you determine what kind of animal it was. Uh, the size of the droppings sometimes helps you identify what the animal might be. Uh, where do you find it? Uh, different places. Sometimes, like sometimes the calling card is on your deck or your front porch. Uh, sometimes it's in your yard. Uh, sometimes it's on the trails that you're walking on. And um, also what's interesting is trying to examine what's in the scat. And uh, did, did you know that there's a profession called uh, scatology? <laughs> <laughs> and there are scatologists that specialize in examining scat to determine the health of the animal, what they're eating, the uh, uh, conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you know, scat's a kind of a friendly term for us to use. It goes by a lot of other names, but it's the same thing. You know, you got scat and crap and poop and doo-doo and number two and the S word. I'm just glad they chose scatology rather than crapology or something like that. You know, so it's a little, a little more friendly. Okay. Coyotes. We got we got coyotes here in Bent Tree. Oh, and I might mention, uh, as they say on TV, the images images you see may be disturbing, but we're going to show them anyhow. <laughs> uh, coyotes. We've got uh, we've got coyotes in Bent Tree. They're uh, very adaptable animals, uh, and. Uh, the coyotes sort of filled the void when the wolves were kind of eradicated years ago. And uh, that's why you're seeing a lot, of, a lot of coyotes nowadays, and they're all over the U.S. And uh, there, there's uh, quite a few in Bent Tree, and you'll basically see them at dusk or, early, or maybe early in the morning. Uh, very seldom will you see them during the day. Um, now, they, they can be identified by the sound. If you have a pack of coyotes and they start howling, uh, very distinctive, and uh, you'll, you'll know it's not a dog, and it's, uh, it's coyotes. So um, 
they're very uh, very stealthy animal um, and they'll uh, they'll dig a den and I'm sure there's dens all over in Bent Tree you may not you may not see them but uh, they're there the tracks as you can see uh, the four uh, claws or digits uh, uh, front and back uh, they're sort of oval shaped and you if you're going to find any tracks you'll probably find them along a trail or on a road it's it's hard to go out in the woods and and find a coyote track or or any other track as far as that's concerned so of course if you're in, in a flower bed where there's where the the the, the imprints can can show uh, you'll see the tracks there, but uh, you'll generally find coyote tracks along a trail, along a road, or what have you. Um, they they tend to rather than walk their their trot, uh, they walk with their tail down, and quite often when they're walking or or trotting, they kind of do it sideways. They're looking sideways, so they have a distinct gate to them but um, the scat is um, falls in the tubular uh, category they're uh, coyotes are not picky eaters so they'll eat just about anything uh, if they're eating berries and so forth their scat may be kind of whitish light color uh, if they're eating some other uh, animal their scat may be dark colored. Uh, you'll see fur in the, in the scat itself. So you can tell a lot by looking at the scat as to what they're eating. And, uh, and also if it's fresh or if it's been there for some time. So um, that's, uh, it has a musty odor, unlike a dog. So uh, if you're not sure if you're looking at dog scat or Coyote scat. Uh, maybe the, if it's a musty odor, chances are it's a it's a coyote. Fox. We've got uh, we've got both gray and red fox here in the uh, tree, but mostly grays. Um, they're uh, the 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 gray fox is uh, a little shorter and a little smaller than the red fox. Um, the gray fox uh, color is sort of a, a grizzled gray with a rusty red color. And uh, it's got a um, dark stripe on the back and the tip of its tail. Uh, that's a pretty good uh, uh, picture of a gray fox there. It, uh, you can see the different, uh, different colors versus the red fox. It may not, it's not necessarily a crimson red but it's a reddish, uh, a reddish color. Yeah. It's uh, very difficult to tell the difference in red fox versus gray fox scat. You can't tell the difference. Um, it uh, can also tell you what they're eating. Uh, and again, just like coyote, you can tell by the color of the scat, whether it's they're eating uh, berries or fruit or what have you uh, versus uh, eating uh, mice or rabbit or something. Yeah. The, uh, the claws are, um, are small and, and sharp. Uh, they generally, a gray fox will generally walk more than a coyote that, that just animals alone. So um, you can see the uh, uh, footprint, the, the track, the uh, four, four toes and claws, and the print will generally show the claws. Um, and that's a pretty good uh, a picture of uh, some prints there. Um, the uh, gray fox, you know, the old den in a wood pile or rock outcropping and so forth. And uh, we've got um, uh, quite a few gray fox, I think, in Bent Tree. Oh, 
occasionally you'll see a, a red fox. But uh, looking at the uh, difference in the prints, trying to determine whether it's a dog or a fox or a coyote, um, you can see on the left the prints of a dog uh, are more rounded and just for illustration, they show if you can draw X through the dog prints uh, and, and if it touches the pads, that's generally a dog, they're closer together. On a fox or a coyote, it's more spread out and the prints are more elongated. So uh, very similar, but some differences, and you have to examine it closely. And you got to get a, you got to get a real good print to be able to make that kind of determination. Yeah, most of the times you'll just find maybe a partial print. White-tailed deer. Well, there's not too much to say about that, but uh, just uh, I want to show you what the white-tailed deer scat looks like. Uh, it falls in the pellet category. Deer, rabbits fall in the pellet category. The, uh, the print is uh, similar to a hog, but uh, it is different. And go to the next slide. You can see the deer print on the right, the dew claws, that's those two claws uh, behind the main hoof. They are aligned with the hoof versus on a wild hog, the dew claws are spread out. They're separated. So, uh, and the other difference is wild hogs are more, the print is more oval Deer, it's more of a heart-shaped print. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, that's basically the the difference in trying to determine whether it's a hog or a deer, and sometimes it's hard to tell. But um, there there is a difference, and the hog, like I said earlier. We fortunately we don't have very many here, but uh, um, very very easy to identify if you actually see them. They can be black, they can be brown, they can be white, they can be three or four different colors. Um, but uh, uh, the, you know the uh, full-grown boar can weigh up three four hundred pounds. Um, the uh, scat, as you can see, is uh, a tubular scat. Um, again, hogs will eat just about anything. So you can sometimes tell what, uh, what, they, uh, what they've been eating. Uh, uh, the scat is very smelly, so you'll know versus a uh, coyote or what have you, their scat is very smelly, so you'll uh, you'll uh, notice the difference. Um, they generally are walking when they're eating. They're just walking in the woods, and they won't stop very long. And they'll just be walking, and they won't stay in one site in one spot very long. Uh, hogs have very poor eyesight and poor hearing, but they have excellent sense of smell. Um, on the one point I wanted to make on the white-tailed deer, um, did you know that a deer generally poops an average of 13 times a day <laughs> and produces about 90, an average of 93 pellets? <laughs> so just keep Keep that in mind. That's a good statistic to know. Yeah. All right. If you're in doubt as to what the 
uprooting is on the ground, whether it's a uh, armadillo or a wild hog, that's a picture of wild hog rootings. It's very aggressive. It, they can root up to a foot deep and they'll just stir up that ground and that is nowhere near an armadillo. That is wild hog rootings. And hopefully we won't see any of that uh, uh, in, in uh, Bent Tree. That's an armadillo. So you can see the difference. An armadillo will dig deep in the ground. They're looking for grub and, and uh, roots and so forth. So um, big difference between what wild hogs will do versus armadillos. And you'll, you may find this on the side of the road. Uh, a lot of times we get a call that people uh, think there's wild hogs in the middle of uh, uh, a road in Bear Tree, and you go look at it, and it's something more like that. Very, it's not very aggressive, and that's uh, that's uh, armadillo. And uh, this is what they look like, and they are in Bear Tree, and very distinctive uh, uh, track. Front and hind have, uh, uh, the front has four toes, claws. The hind uh, have five. So it's unusual uh, that they have different number of claws on uh, front versus uh, hind claws. Yeah. Uh, they're, uh, Armadillo generally weigh between 7 and 15 pounds. Um, the, as you can see, the head, the body, the tail, legs, they're all covered with a thick leathery um, skin. And that's, that's their armor. That's, armadillo is a, uh, really means a little armored one. And they are, as you can see, armored. Uh, very difficult to pierce that. Um, uh, they, um, they when 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 they're foraging, they're kind of walking slowly. They they'll, they'll be digging, and uh, their eyesight's not all that great. You can get pretty close to them, but once they'll see you, and they run away. You very seldom see them during the day. Um, they are nocturnal, and uh, they like uh, kind of sandy areas where they can where they can dig deep. Um, black bear. I'm not sure where Dora got that picture of that bear, but maybe <laughs> she might have been trying to collect free samples, uh, but. Uh, Either that or he got into some uh, green persimmons or something. But uh, anyway, black bear. We've got, as you know, plenty here in, in Bent Tree. And uh, uh, there's uh, bear scat falls into the clump category. Yeah, and uh, they eat just about anything and you can pretty much tell what bears are eating by the examination of, uh, of the scat, uh, the berries and seeds. Uh, if they're feeding on a carcass or something, the scat's generally darker and uh, much smellier. So uh, the... Uh, Tell them, is it true that if you find pepper spray and a whistle in the scat, so that's a bear scat. <laughs> that, that, that's right. If you find them in the scat, uh, yeah, it's a, it's an aggressive one. <laughs> um, the uh, bear scat, the dump is in a pile, six, seven inches wide, and everything, and. Uh, uh, you can uh, pretty much find uh, the scat anywhere in, 
in the woods, uh, not necessarily on trails or what have you. Um, but uh, if you uh, if you see a dump like that, you can pretty much determine it's it's a bear, uh, especially if it's got a lot of uh, uh, berries and seed and grain in it. Their 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 track <coughs> is very um. As you can see up there, the hind uh, foot pretty much resembles a human foot. The front paws, only the front pads will, will show. Uh, I was picking blackberries in uh, Dawson Forest one year on Azalea Trail. And while I was picking blackberries, I looked down and I saw this footprint. And I said, "Gosh, some little kid barefooted has been picking my blackberries." <laughs> well, I examined it a little further, and it was bear print, like that bottom hind. Uh, it looked just like a human print. So uh, that's what a bear track looks like. Raccoons got plenty of those in bent tree. They're uh, very easy to recognize, and uh, especially with the ring tail. Pictures of the scat that you see there, it falls in the tubular category. Now this picture right here is uh, thanks to Huff. He got a, saw a raccoon where on the boat ramp, and uh, he left a calling card, and uh, Huff sent me that picture. So. Thought I'd show you this is pure uh, bent tree raccoon scat. Raccoons, uh, they'll pretty much uh, eat anything. Uh, the raccoon scat is, uh, can carry a parasite. So if you choose to venture out and uh, do some examining, make sure you're wearing gloves and don't get too close to it. It carries a, uh, uh, a parasite that uh, can be fatal to humans. So uh, that's uh, one thing that uh, you need to be aware of on raccoons. And where you'll find the droppings, uh, you know, could very well be in your attic because they have been known to get up in attics and uh, but uh, most of the time you'll find uh, uh, their, uh, the scat on the ground on the porch you may find on the deck because they will come up on your deck and on your porch um, and uh, it's basically what it looks like well we've got a few rabbits left in um, the tree but with more and more coyotes, they're becoming rather scarce. The uh, scat is a, a pellet type um, scat. It's a small uh, round and you can see the uh, tracks. The claws generally don't show because there's a lot of fur around their, their, uh, their paws they, uh, and but the only time you'll ever see a rabbit uh, track is uh, uh, if there's frost or snow on the ground. Very hard to find. And you've probably seen rabbits before. They travel by hopping. Uh, they uh, generally hang around brushy areas. You, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll see them in your yard. Uh, the droppings will be anywhere in the yard. It's not necessarily in any... Um, uh, set location. Awesome. Got plenty of those here in Pear Tree. They're generally found uh, just about uh, anywhere in Pear Tree. Um, and you may see them during the day, but they're nocturnal. And uh, the uh, what's unusual about their track is the uh, front the front track. Uh, five toes. Uh, the hind track has 
uh, claws on four of the five toes. There's one, one toe that does not have a claw and that's what they use for climbing and so forth. Very unusual uh, track, but it looks like a hand with a thumb. So uh, if you see that track, uh, uh, you can pretty well rest assured that uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a possum. Possum scat can also transmit a disease uh, that will mimic the flu. So be careful if uh, you're uh, examining possum scat or close to it, it can carry uh, uh, a, a parasite that uh, is dangerous. And you can see the scat's kind of an unusual shape. It's a tubular and is generally tapered at the end, uh, brownish color. Bobcats, we've got bobcats here in Big Tree, not uh, not many, but they are here. Uh, they've got uh, the, the track itself, uh, uh, four, four toes, uh, and it generally won't show any claw marks. It'll just show the, uh, the uh, toe print. Uh, they like dense, dense cover. Uh, Bobcats, whatever they kill, rabbit, mice, whatever, they like to eat on it and then bury it and cover it up and they may come back and, and, uh, and eat on it. Uh, that's a uh, typical color of a, of a bobcat, sort of a, uh, a yellowish to reddish brown color, uh, just a little larger than a house cat. And uh, the scat itself, uh, it's uh, kind of constricted, but uh, uh, once it dries up, it separates and it might look like it was pellets, but it's, uh, it kind of um, uh, disintegrates. So we do have some in, um, in Bentry and uh, Again, bobcat, if you find the scat, it'll generally be along a trail or a road um, and not necessarily just out in the open. Other calling cards, well, you've got our beavers and uh, no doubt what that is. Uh, we've had several trees along the lake that have been taken by beavers and uh, very easy to identify them. Last but not least, <laughs> this guy's made in China. Uh, if you've been following all the discussion about the uh, origin of COVID-19, uh, there's some uh, people that feel like it originated from a raccoon dog. That was obviously a cross between a raccoon and a dog, and again, only in China. <laughs> So if you see this fellow here in Bear Tree, <laughs> make sure you let public safety know because if they come here and cross with our feral hogs, we're in deep doo-doo. <laughs> Any questions? I don't think so. Uh, oh, 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 oh. I mean, other than the hogs, yeah. And raccoons, rabies. They, they're closer to stomach than more than rabies than raccoons. I've got some uh, handouts. Uh, Ken uh, referred me to uh, just a pocket handout of different tracks and so forth. So uh, I'll have them on the table here and uh, go ahead and pick up one on your way out. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>